was raised by my mom, uh, who was a church organist and choir director and piano teacher and everything extraordinary. Uh, grew up with three younger sisters. We were a completely female household. So my father left when I was very young. So we were um, a wild bunch of women. My father, who left, was Lutheran. Uh, and as a young adult, I converted to Catholicism. So I am now a Roman Catholic. My mother thought that was funny because she said, well, of course, you grew up in the liturgical tradition of the Lutherans and the social justice tradition of the UCC, so of course you're going to be Roman Catholic. The most vivid memories I have is being about five or six years old and lying on my back on the steps going up to the altar in our big old church with the organ booming out behind. So this deep sense of the wonder and awe of this incredibly powerful musical sound. Um, was a very important part of, of my sense of connection to God. And then, um, because I'm old enough, that divorce in a community when I was young was a, a not a good thing. Uh, we were shunned by large parts of the community, except that our church was home, and our church was really uh, a powerful community of folks coming around us. And she would, because she was raising us by herself, you know, it's kind of hard to afford babysitters, so she would take us to church and we would hang out there while she would practice and teach her students. And so we had the run of the building and you know those big empty sanctuary spaces. You know, there's still some wonderful, um, uh, like the Takata in Fugue, I don't know, maybe it was Bach. I mean, there were some really very, um, you know, loud, grandiose organ pieces that would just fill the whole room, right? And I would just be this little person lying on my back looking up at the soaring ceiling and with the music all around. And uh, just a really, a really deep sense of being connected to something larger than myself that was worthy of reverence and awe. That was my saving grace, right? I was a really smart little kid. And that was, um, uh, that was a way to succeed. That was a way to get um, uh, you know, credence, you know, um, I remember as a child wearing a lot of hand-me-down clothes and not being able to do all the stuff that friends were doing because it cost money and yet being the brightest kid in the class, right, or having the teachers who would kind of keep an eye out for you and that kind of stuff. And that's how I ended up leaving Oshkosh, Wisconsin because I had a high school teacher who was adamant that I should go to Yale. I had no idea what Yale was. I had no idea, you know, um, but she had me apply and I got it accepted early action and at that point, you know, who was I to turn down this offer? So, yeah, that was education. So I left Wisconsin to go out to New Haven, Connecticut to Yale um, and you have to imagine this little girl from Oshkosh, Wisconsin, right? Little white girl from this little community um, arriving into New Haven, Connecticut at the start of the Reagan era. So I graduated from high school in 1981, began in the fall of 1981, had never met a person who was homeless, did not know that there was significant hunger in the world, landed at Yale. I don't know if you've ever been to Yale. It's a huge Gothic institution in the middle of it at the time, what was the seventh poorest city of its size in the country. So I was in literal culture shock going from, you know, our our undergraduate dorms across to Calvin College, which was my college at Yale, and you'd walk past the gate and there'd be people begging at the gate, and you'd walk into this enormously well-appointed room with, you know, 12 kinds of cereal and egg, you know, I mean, just the abundance was um, uh, completely disorienting. So, um, so I fled to the chaplain's office at Yale because that was the only place that seemed like home, and uh, Yale had, and I think still has, an organization called Dwight Hall, which is uh, the remnants of a student YMCA that is a nonprofit organization that is on Yale's campus but um, empowers students to do social justice, social um, action kinds of things. And so I became, you know, enamored of everything to do with New Haven that wasn't Yale. You know, I ended up uh, with a degree in American Studies, but having taken a lot of courses up at the Yale Div School. I was at a very for I was there at a very fortunate time because we had people like Cornell West who were coming through to do guest tents at the Div School. Uh, Skip Gates was teaching courses at Yale. It was a really um, 
wonderful time of being, of, of seeing that the stuff that you were learning really mattered in the world and that you could have a, um, a deeply, I mean, you could be thinking deeply about really big things and then you could go and do something about it. So um, I have vivid memories of being involved in the anti-apartheid movement and, you know, we were doing civil disobedience and stuff and we'd end up, you know, all these Yale kids we'd end up in the New Haven jail. And our teacher, so Cornell West, had this wonderful picture of him coming to visit us in the New Haven jail, right? So this was this um, connected sense of um, what you believed made a difference in the world and what you were studying was making a difference in the world. And that was entirely Dwight Hall. Um, it wasn't really, I mean, there were probably parts of Yale that knew that, but my life was lived in Dwight Hall.